Thanks for participating in the Gig Economy PMI Champlain Valley Fall 2020 webinar series. This is our last session. This is number 10. Let me welcome our distinguished panelists. We're asking that as we call on each of you, please tell us your name and working title, a little bit about your organization and your area of expertise in the gig economy. Um, if we could start with Emma, if you'd let us know about yourself, please. Thanks, thanks a lot, Neil, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emma, and I'm the founder and CEO of OneCircle, OneCircleHR.com. OneCircle is uh, a community of freelance HR consultants that are available virtually to work on projects on demand. Uh, and uh, we just went live in March 2020, <laughs> right in time when the uh, pandemic hit uh, uh, the world. Um, it, it was for almost two years in the making. We couldn't have timed it more perfectly <laughs> in a weird kind of way. I'm originally Lebanese. I lived and worked most of my life in the Middle East. I'm currently now in Johannesburg, South Africa, where we launched to One Circle. Uh, and yeah, my background, I come from a corporate background. So I've worked in corporates for more than 20 years, specifically in HR. So I'm not a tech person. Uh, but we are definitely a technology company, which makes it very exciting for my CTO to have a lot of conversations with me. <laughs> but, but yes, I'm excited to be here and for us to have great and amazing conversations. And thank you. Thanks, Emma. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming and staying up so late. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, Paul's yet to join us. Uh, Laurel, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Laurel Farr. I'm the CEO of Distribute Consulting. I'm also the founder of the Remote Work Association. So as you may guess, I'm a remote work nerd. Um, we are the premier consulting agency that specializes exclusively in remote work. So what that means is that we're pioneering the conversation on virtual organizational development and behavior and understanding how we can optimize performance and operations as distributed teams. So I'm here to answer all of the questions about operating a distributed team. Um, and while I let the gig experts really shine in their areas. Oh, you'll have plenty of opportunity to talk, I'm, I'm sure. Thanks, Laurel, appreciate you joining us. Uh, Michael Lee. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Lee, founder and CEO of Reconciled and a few other companies based here in Burlington, Vermont. And um, here to talk about uh, just my experience working with both remote workers as well as uh, gig economy workers uh, have a, between the three companies, I have uh, about 35 employees as well as a dozen uh, contractors, uh, gig workers across the USA. And uh, you can find out more about me and the work I do at michaellee.co. Um, that's Lee spelled L Y dot C O. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Brian, who are you? Uh, I ask myself that question every day. Um, uh, Brian Pena, I'm the Chief of Market Strategy at a company called the MBO Partners. Uh, we are a, um, a independent contractor platform business and at any given time we're employing about anywhere from eight to 10,000 people on our platform and we spe specialize in engaging and managing independent contractors and direct relationships between enterprises and individuals directly. Prior to joining MBO, uh, I was a uh, Senior Vice President of Continued Workforce Strategies where I, for the last 11 years, I worked with uh, Fortune 100 companies designing and implementing and establishing research around the evolving world of work and what it means to be employed. So um, covering anything from legislation to commercialization to optimization strategies for uh, all forms of uh, human capital. So I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, very poignant. Thank, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, and uh, let's see, Andrea. Hello, I'm Andrea Vanny. Um, I'm the founder and principal consultant for the Moray Group. And with the Moray Group, we are really focusing on creating quality processes and efficiencies within management, and making sure that we can get teams up and running and running smoothly. You know, allowing the project management that they need to really excel their programs. And you know, our, my slogan is, we're gonna spin your fate because we all have the opportunity to decide what our, success, our successes are going to be. And I help people and teams 
find that success. And, you know, I worked, my background is primarily in life sciences and pharmaceutical. And again, focusing on the quality the process and construction of, you know, these life-saving facilities that are creating vaccines and healthcare related mm -hmm. elements. Yeah. So we can find more at themoreag.com and it's M-O-I-R-A-E-G.com. And you've got everybody's uh, LinkedIn um, here, guys, and we'll also, we'll, we'll send out a follow-up email with greater detail for, for all of these folks in the organizations. And last but not least, Molly Yanis. It's only because of the why, Molly. It's only because I know, of the I know. Sure, Neil. All right, so everyone, hi, my name is Molly Yanis, and I am the founder, CEO, and project man manager at Echo Consulting. We provide high-quality experience project management services, and uh, we just started in 2019. Um, and we are located in Burlington, Vermont. So as project managers, we all know that projects are meant to be temporary. I'm sure you've heard that before, um, but success should not be. And that's why we really believe that um, all size teams, including small and mid-sized companies, um, deserve access to project management um, that can provide clear, actionable, measurable plans for both short-term and long-term success. Um, and so again, and I'm Molly with Echo Consulting. You can learn more at echoprojectmanagement.com. And I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. All right, Molly, thank you so much. Okay, well, let's kick things off with the first question. And um, those of you who, who submitted your questions ahead of time, we really appreciate it. Um, we did cheat a little bit and I put it out in front of the, the panel here. These all are, are all busy people though, so I don't know how much time they, they molded over. Um, but here's one, and I'll, I'll put the questions in the chat as we go so we kind of have them on the record here. And this first one comes from um, uh, Susan Cook. And uh, Susan says, are contracting, consulting, freelancing, and being independent slash self-employed all basically the same thing? Or are there important differences? And why don't I start going back up the list? And Molly, you want to take a shot at this one first? Absolutely. So um, I would... I would say that they are not all the same thing. Um, specifically, consulting is the one that's most obvious to me. Um, I think that we can all name a couple of consultancies such as Deloitte and some other ones, right, that are rather large and not independent contracting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say consulting is the really obvious one, right? Um, and consulting can mean a lot of things based on the different specialties. I won't dive too much in there because we have a lot of different consultants that are on the call today. Um, in terms of contracting and freelancing, again, and the only thing I would say there is for contracting, um, I, I think that those are large organizations as well. So there are organizations specifically, whether they are staffing agencies um, or houses that focus on contracting. Um, and uh, the independent self-employed piece, um, I would say that that goes more in with the freelancing. But again, consulting, I would definitely say is talking about the services that you're offering. And I think it can be a much larger house. All right. Thanks, Molly. Uh, anybody else want to contribute to that? What are your thoughts? We, I know that we have some, some folks in the room that, uh, you know, that have different experiences along those lines. Go ahead yeah. and speak up. So, I mean, I would say the biggest, on top of what Molly has already said, that consulting is really diving into, it's not just necessarily doing the work. You're not going to go in, take a contract role, and execute a scope for a project or freelance where you're going to provide them a product at the end, but the consulting is where you're going to work with a team or management and help guide them in the direction versus doing it for them. Hmm. I think uh, it's also Neil, if I, yeah, so you go, go ahead, ahead Laura. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Mine is US based, so I know that we're not overlapping. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, my two cents to add here is that we're primarily talking about a difference here in tax structure, right? So mm -hmm. self-employment is a W-2 employee. Um, independent contractor is, is uh, the W-9 version of the, the employee, so that they are withholding their own taxes. And then freelancing is the shorter version. It's not recognized by the tax structure, but freelancing is a much, much, uh, well, typically much shorter engagement from a few hours to a few days to a few weeks. So freelancing would be short term, uh, contracting would be longer term, you know, standardized, and then uh, employment is much more permanent. Again, that's sim oversimplified, but in general, that's what you can expect. Emma, what do you think? 
so we do have a lot of independent consultants that do that work on HR projects and HR related projects, and they their interventions they are vary between as Laurel said a few days or some of them it's up to six months. So it's if it's if it's a big project, but but yeah, there's there's that fine line between the independent consultant and the freelancer, but. But I guess it's it's very nominal, so um, it 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 comes in with that level of expertise and 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 as a skilled professional, and they prefer to be called independent consultant. But as a matter of fact, they have their own uh, independent setup and a company. They work individually. They take projects. They work on platforms like One Circle and 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 other platforms. But but as well, it in. They are working project to project on demand virtually. So they are doing freelance work. They do get repetitive clients though, um, depending on the projects. Uh, but yes, the depth of expertise is there. So this is this is when, when we think freelance, we think of, as Laurel said, smaller interventions, very quick ones. Uh, but, but with consulting, it goes more in depth with the clients. Okay, great. And we can definitely, I, th I think that we'll cycle back on this theme, you know, obviously, as we go through the rest of the questions here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question, you guys. And this one's a little longer to get through. So, um, and this one is from Tim Holland. Th thanks, Tim, for your question. Uh, so Tim says, um, or asks, are contracting, consulting, freelancing, and being, oh, wait, uh, sorry. <laughs> this is the same one you said. Here we go. How and or when does the gig economy allow businesses to focus more on their business? For example, state government isn't in the business of doing IT projects, yet they consume them and their resources at the expense of taxpayer dollars. Are there any specific gig economy strategies that can help businesses refocus on their primary missions? Yeah, I can start on, on this question. Um, one of the primary advantages of the gig economy is that if you're an entrepreneur or even if you're an in, uh, independent, you know, consultancy, um, you can pr uh, focus on your primary core service or, or selling your primary core product. And then, you know, the, you can use terms outsource, uh, freelance, contract out the areas of your business that aren't in your strength or that you don't want to uh, accomplish in-house. So, for example, uh, Reconciled's in the business of providing um, online and remote accounting, full stack accounting services for small businesses, small companies. So companies that don't want to build an internal accounting department, primarily because the entrepreneur or business owner doesn't have the skill set, nor doesn't want to create the skill set in-house to or manage, have to manage an accounting team in-house, can outsource that work to us as a company. Now, they're not using a freelancer. Reconciled is not a freelance company. It's like an actual company. Um, and we have employees that work for us as well as contractors. But that skill set of accounting, uh, a company can go, uh, a company can go out, or even a, an independent person can go out and hire somebody to do the accounting work, do the marketing work for them, do sales work for them, so that they can stay on their core, their core focus. Mm -hmm. um, and one, you know, one bit of comment that relates to the previous, to the previous question, um, the IRS, and depending on what state you're in, is very particular in regards to the, the difference between an employee and a contractor. Mm -hmm. And one area they look at is, is your, if, are you hiring people to conduct or do your primary business that you're selling? And so, for example, if you sell accounting services, but you're outsourcing marketing because you don't do accounting services, you're outsourcing marketing for your own firm, maybe you're outsourcing marketing for some of your clients because they're asking you to do that, but you don't do that then you can freely say those people you outsource to are independent, right? They're separate from you versus as an accounting firm, I can't go and just contract out accounting work. I actually sell it as my primary business. So that's one of the, one of the uh, primary definitions or specializations that help, you know, that, that a lot of states or even the IRS uses to say, are you mistreating or misclassifying people as, uh, as contractors versus employees? So I would say that's an advantage of the gig economy is you're able to outsource the areas where you don't feel like you have strength or it's not the primary service or product you're selling. Right. Excellent. So, so a couple of different answers to this question, and really it's kind of the core of, of what we do. Um, it's interesting being on the panel because uh, I, I've mostly spent my time, my career working with enterprises on how to best use people. And it's interesting to think about how uh, a lot of folks are, are executing on, on some of those strategies. Um, 
So it's really cool. Uh, I, I think when it comes to defining why people use uh, kind of flexible work uh, different than uh, full-time hires is in addition to accommodating peaks and valleys of demand, um, it really is about having the, the most appropriate access to some of the latest strategies. If we think about uh, the pace of change in technology, the number of jobs that exist, the number of key technologies that exist now and, and the like, um, the ability to stay on top of those things is incredibly difficult to do. And so when you look at the broader open talent economy, it's a way for you to tap into greater levels of innovation and greater levels of strategic value that go beyond uh, your four walls. Uh, another key element of it is a lot of companies that we work with look at divining and kind of really deciding the art of total talent management and looking at what's the best way to get things done. And it is really a, if you think about all the modes of engagement, it's not just a full-time hire or a consultancy, it's full-time hire, consultancies, agency staff, temp, innovative contractors, interns, offshore, nearshore, uh, even artificial intelligence. And putting all of those things together is really what, in my opinion, the workforce of tomorrow is gonna be about. Uh, another thing I just want to really call out really quickly, because it's an important distinction, that just because uh, you're working independently doesn't mean you have to be a 1099. Okay, so, so, that, so uh, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the, the IRS classification rules about working on the things in California. We have the AB5 test. Uh, there's also the ABC test in Massachusetts and the patchwork quilt of state and local laws to do that. The, the issue is not about being independent or not. It's about um, are you paying your taxes and are you, paying, are you an employee of yeah. somebody? So there's millions of ways to engage with, with companies uh, as a gig worker. It's not just about being a 1099. You're not just necessarily going to be constrained in that one as well. And that goes back to the previous question. Can, can I add something, Neil, here on, on the second question? Yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> the most used. Go well, ahead, just go ahead and assume. You want to start <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to add something that when businesses focus on, 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 on their core offering as well, and they have a core, a strong core team, and they plug in the talent that they need uh, as and when needed on demand, they also bring in an infusion of innovation and creativity into the team. So new thoughts, new ideas, new ways of working, and and it's it it as well it becomes when once um, once you get into having those blended teams and working with them and uh, th that flow of knowledge into your own core team is amazing uh, uh, so 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 yeah definitely focusing on the core offering but as well thinking on what needs to get done as Brian said so and and Michael so it's basically re redefining work not in terms of roles that we need to fill, but actually what needs to be done in order for us to deliver uh, on our strategy and to the business, and then accordingly plugging in the skills that are required. So there's magic in that if done, um, if done, if done well, basically. Fantastic. Okay. One other piece I would say about that is the specialization. So when it says, are there any specific gig right. economy strategies that can help business refocus on primary missions? So if you're looking at hiring, oftentimes you're looking at that breadth skill set, right? Whereas when you are hiring, uh, you know what I mean, in a gig and you're more flexible in your employment, um, you are able to have those specialists at the capacity that you need for that specific project. So rather than picking the best person on your team and everything and trying to have them kind of learn as they go, you can actually pick someone that has specific targeted experience on that, that, that fresh perspective and that experience on your team that you wouldn't necessarily need full time um, and or long term. Or can't afford even uh, Molly because, because the specialist expertise comes at a very high price. Very much exactly. So. Yeah. Yep. No, exactly. And so especially when you're looking at smaller, we were specifically, this question was about government bigger, but at, for smaller companies, especially in midsize, they don't necessarily need a full-time contractor. They do not need a full-time hire. Their capacity needs are only short term. And so the flexibility to have specialists that can come in part-time and um, short term is, is a huge benefit to these smaller companies that might not otherwise have access to that um, expertise. And I think it's also important to point out that oftentimes they mentioned, they mentioned the, I think Tim mentioned taxpayer dollars in his, uh, in his thing specifically kind of with the implication of that phrasing is that it's more expensive. Leveraging gig workers is probably one of the least expensive ways to manage and uh, to get things done. You know, people, pesky people are very expensive to employ. 
And so leveraging the economy allows organizations to get more done with less and more strategically targeted uh, resources. Right. Okay. All right, well, let's move on now. Um, thank you for that, everybody. So this next one is from Kristen Knight. And she asks, do you have any tips on how to hire contractors? Red flags to look for, what qualities would make good integrations into a temporary team or temporary work? Um, Maybe a, a good place to start if you don't mind, guys. You cut out for a second, Neil. Cut out. Who did you oh, ask? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> of course, it wasn't going to be who was it. Laurel, could you start with this one, please? <laughs> That's hilarious. I thought, I was like, well, of course it's not me. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so I'll start on the broad side and then we can all get more and more specific. Um, For me, when I'm hiring specifically independent contractors, I think I always start with the uh, scope of work. What is the duration that I'm hiring them for? Um, So if I'm hiring them, trying to integrate them into a task force team for, let's say, six months or longer, I'm going to be much heavier in my screen because I'm thinking about them more as a team member. So I'm going to be looking at factors like culture match and uh, working styles and, and, you know, going more in depth into the hiring and talent acquisition process. Um, However, if I'm just looking for uh, a technical skill and I'm, I'm just utilizing them for a few hours or a few days, then I'm much more focused on exclusively their portfolio and uh, just letting their results and previous work speak for themselves. Um, so that's where, where I would start is if it's short term, you can focus just on hard skills, but if it's longer term, you're going to want to prioritize hard skills um, supplemented with soft skills as well. And now I'll turn it over to whoever wants to keep the conversation going. <laughs> Any takers? This is a, uh, this yeah, is I'll easy carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll carry on from Laurel on this one. Um, as well, yeah, something very important is to keep in mind that project brief because your 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 freelancer, independent contractor, etc., their delivery is as good as the brief that you give them. So uh, the more the more structured you are in ex- knowing exactly what you need done, how you need it done, what are the deliverables and the milestones, the timeline, and agreeing on that, uh, uh, the 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 better chance you have of getting a great work out of the freelancer. I would say as well, one more thing is we all expect when we are uh, uh, hiring a freelancer to get something done for us, especially if it's, you know, it's an exciting project. We all expect them to be as excited as us, which lots of, <laughs> lots of times they are not, they are excited to deliver great quality work because their reputation is at stake. They are also building their own portfolio. So they want to deliver great work, quality work. They want you to be happy, but they might not have the same level of excitement. So, and, and we see that uh, very often with, with startups or a small, small startups that are in growth mode where they're really excited about getting projects done and then they get disappointed if they don't if they don't see that level of excitement from the freelancers mm-hmm. um and and this is where the focus and the shifts come back to uh, clarity on the project brief milestones timelines uh etc one of the things that i i think is really an important thing to consider when you're hiring contractors is um, really having a deep understanding about their bedside manner, right? How are they, if you, especially if they're going to be relating to your core clients, uh, making sure that they have a cultural fit, not just their like personal and social and, but you know, do they have a, a way of representing your brand uh, that you want to approve of? So the, this notion of, uh, of leveraging ICs, oftentimes um, you forget the fact you get caught up in the resume, but really, you know, you're hiring the person, not the resume. And so you have to make sure that not just you have a good working relationship with that person and that their skills are commensurate with the expectations and requirements of the job, but they're going to represent you appropriately with the end client to the extent they're interacting with them. If they're at the cold face of your business and they have a bad bedside manner, it's going to make you look bad 
and they're not going to care that they're a subcontractor. They're going to care that you brought them into the room. Right, right. right? And, what a, and what a difficulty for a business to, you know, especially if they're trying to make that change or they're trying to take advantage of, of you know, to join the gig economy, to get that level of expertise. But, you know, um, uh, what a risk. So, you know, what are, what are some strategies maybe you guys that, um, and I'm sorry, and I want to welcome Paul. Paul, sorry that you. <laughs> sorry. Welcome. Um, you know, what are, what are strategies um, um, from, from the panelists, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, to help ensure that um, they're meeting that fit? Like, what's what you just spoke to, Brian, you know, like, it's, well, some of you know, really, the, 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 the key thing to remember is um, you want to take while you're while you're engaging a person, you're not hiring the talent, you're engaging in a business transaction. These are independent business people. So, so the key things that you want to recognize is really understand the type of role that you're going to be hiring for. Um, and for us, you know, we always make that determination of independent contractor or W-2. Does it qualify to what Michael referenced earlier? Um, but I, I'm really, really obsessed with their, you know, their history. Who, who what other clients have they worked on? Have they, can I check their references? If their references check out, then you ask the, the level two questions, you know. It's easy to find a good reference. You have to find a way to tease out little things. Um, did they arrive at the milestones on time or as scheduled? Um, did they go under budget or over budget? Um, uh, were the milestones that you agreed upon clearly articulated and appropriately specced? Did they come on board with an SOW or did you have to really tweak it over time? And how quickly did they respond to uh, changes in scope, which the enable scope creep, those sorts of things. Um, reference checking is more than just, uh, you know, to me, the, the best thing is to have a regimented reference check process. Um, so it's consistent and applicable. And every time somebody comes in, you know uh, how to tease the, the fact from the fiction. And another thing that I, I really kind of always am interested in is, is uh, understand the failure modes within the projects that the resource has been putting out. And, and failure modes to me are any deviation from the expected outcome. Mm -hmm. So a project that ends way early is as much of a failure as one that ends way late. So that understanding that deviance and appetite you have and the ability of that particular uh, uh, gig worker or resource or however to be able to respond to that um, are, are some of the just some things that I, I think are critical. Yeah, I, and it, I, 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 oh, I, I, real, real quick, I just want to say too is uh, I liked what you said, Brian, and I think often we forget because often for a lot of small business owners, especially, we, for, we they have a hard time differentiating between um, an employee who you're, you're their boss, you're their supervisor, yeah. you have certain responsibilities as an employer, but with the contractor, you're their customer. Yep. And that's a shift people have a hard time remembering because you want this contractor to be part of your team. So you think they're like the employee who's also part of your team, right. but there's expectations that you should have for that contractor, that gig, gig worker that you're now in a position of customer, they're a, they're a vendor and you're paying them. You're, you should be expecting what you would expect like a customer in any other place. Absolutely. Exactly. Good service. You should expect, you know, promptness. You should expect um, them to resolve problems. You should be expect them to show up on time and be, be forward in communication. I mean, there's all these things, things, expectations you actually don't put on an employee because for an employee, you're not their customer. Right. In many ways, we treat our employees as our customer, as an employer. We treat them like a customer. And so there's that positioning you have to kind of approach the relationship with that's very different. Like what Brian said, it's a, it's a business transaction versus, yes. versus you're taking care of the well-being of a human being or in their family as an, if they're an employee. So there is something that I think a lot of people, as they approach it, have to remember that it's not the same. Even though it's two human beings, it's not the same, and it shouldn't be treated the same. Can I bring one more question, Neil? And Michael, thank you for that. I think that's a fantastic expansion. I um, would disagree with you. We, oh, look, I'm sorry. No, I, I, and, and I, know, no. I know you're going to disagree with me, Paul. I okay. know it right now. I know you're going to agree with both of us. So, right. so uh, really quickly, I just want to point out one, one really important element that's in, important in terms of contract law. So, so one of the things that you want to remember when you're engaging in this, that your contracting needs to be very specific because uh, – and then we can get a whole rabbit hole here. But um, when you buy a pencil, there's a contract that exists between me and the store. It's called the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, services are not covered by the UCC. So you need to make sure that you have really well-crafted uh, agreements with your gig workers, independent contractors, because that's going to be the governing principles in case there's any sort of conflict 
uh, eventually when you go to court. So a handshake and a smile is great when you're buying a good, but if you're engaging independent contractors, have a well a well crafted contract structure in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We're, getting to, we're, getting to, we're getting to time on this one. We've still got a slew more questions, so I want to move on. We can always cycle back if there's time. We can always cycle back. Um, so so I want to I, I want to keep moving on. And, and Paul, I want to engage you because I know you're a little late getting on, but thanks thanks for joining us. Um, so here's here's a new one. Um, but you know these these questions are going to sound more and more in the same vein as we as we have these discussions as the night goes on. Um, this one is from Brian Williams, and he says, how do you suggest we approach a business case for gig workers with the skills needed for our business, especially when the business decision makers are not fully aware of the skills required? That second sentence, obviously, is the meat of that, um, of that question. Um, Paul, you want to take, take a stab at that one first? Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to also bring this back. It's, it's the same. It's a very interesting question, and it also refutes a little bit of what Brian was saying so eloquently, my honorable friend and colleague <laughs> stated. I, I just wanted to in, in these, this day and age, I want to make sure that my disagreement is is respectful and <laughs> careful. Um, look, you know, I had to make the case to a large corporation that we did not have the skill internally and that we needed to engage freelancers. And, and you know, it was a very hard case to make every day. I think the thing, you know, before you start getting into SOWs and checking references, just try it. Find a small project that you can engage a freelancer and try it and then take that success and do it again. I think a lot of times um, we, we put heavy, you know, when you're hiring a full-time employee, that's a commitment to get married. You know, I think as, as Michael and, and Brian were saying, like, there's a very long and there's a, a, a relationship there that has to be longstanding. A lot of the freelancers that I have in my network, um, I didn't get by checking their references. I gave them a piece of work. Mm -hmm. I gave them a small piece of work, and then we figured out, hey, can we work together? I work crazy early mornings. You work at night. Ah, that no matter how great you are, that's going to be a challenge. So, mm -hmm. and, and you know, bedside manner and all the things that, that Brian was talking about. But, you know, I think sometimes we forget just to get started. And when you go with that story, and that's why I wrote the, the book, is I wanted to tell the story of, hey, for me, it all started the first time I engaged a freelancer and started to realize that around the world, there are amazing people that, that can do amazing things. I mean, mm -hmm. My newsletter goes out to 95,000 people every week. And, and my partner in that newsletter is a gentleman named Tim that lives in Nigeria. You know, and, and I, didn't, I don't know, you know, I know that Tim has a, a BA in statistics, uh, but I didn't look at his resume. We just started working together and we've been together a year and a half and have coffee once a month. And so I think there's a lot of constructs that we bring to engaging freelancers that are very different. It's about the work and, and put a couple of projects out there and get started. Then one day you'll wake up and have 15 freelancers that are in your network uh, that you can you know, rely on for, for a lot of different things. And it takes time. It's a new muscle. That's why I call it a new mindset. Like you almost have to forget a lot of the ways that you used to work uh, and really retrain yourself. Uh, but to prove it to any manager type, because trust me, I, I had to prove it to executives at big companies. I just kept telling them stories of, of the successful engagements I was having. I was telling them the output and showing it to them. And then I was telling them how much it cost. Uh, and one of those things would usually get through to them. Great, excellent. Any, anybody else wanna, wanna keep rolling with that one for, for a few minutes? I, yeah, I'd like to add something on, on that one. I fully agree with Paul on ter in terms of the flexibility. So we, we have, we can leverage this flexibility of, of uh, experimenting and experimenting with different uh, freelancers on different smaller projects and, and then and then figuring it out but one thing as well that we need to keep in mind is that as we as we ensure all the compliance and all the contractual agreements and everything is in place is that those freelancers they are entrepreneurs as well they're building their own reputation it's their it's their in their own best interest is to put great work out there so i'm not saying to blindly engage with people but also to keep that in mind right because this is what they do for a living so uh, you, you you do get the ones that are not uh, uh, um, uh, committed, but you get a lot of people who are 
self-motivated, who are self-disciplined, who want to make this as a career, who wants to work on exciting projects. So, uh, and there's a lot of them out there. Uh, uh, definitely we need to do our homework, right? And, and, and then, yeah, the best way is to actually experiment and build a relationship. And with the relationship comes a level of trust. And once you have that trust, then your project and your commitment to the freelancer grows. Can I, can I make one quick question? One, I, Paul, I don't, I don't disagree with you at all, which is surprising, <laughs> which is usually, I know, we, 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 the, 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 the night is still young, as it were. Um, you know, when we think about uh, the building the business case, I think you're looking at flexibility and, and, and cost and all these other things, and, and then you have to really understand the different modes of engagement. Paul used a great example of uh, open source talent by sourcing an individual in Nigeria. Um, that's a fantastic example and very accessible with its own challenges as well. Um, as opposed to maybe supplanting your existing project that you have for uh, a steel mill down the street with uh, third party resources. Those are two very, very different engagement modes, right? So you want to make sure you're really clear on that. And when you're making that decision, you have to understand going back to the, 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 the contractual piece, you have to understand the way that those platforms work. I'll give you an example really quickly. Uh, Fiverr. Fiverr is a, a great platform. I use them all the time for a lot of different stuff. But what a lot of people and I might not realize is that when you engage a contractor through Fiverr, you're governed by the Fiverr terms of use. Those Fiverr terms of use. I got I to gotta interrupt you. We have a question that's asking exactly about Fiverr and the other platforms. So I don't want to. No, no, no. Okay. So, I, oh, do we do? Well, let me, let me, I just want to, anyway, we can get to that later. But the main, I want to finish the point and I can hit that later. Um, in the Fiverr terms of use, I'm using as an example, uh, you as the client only have a license to the product. You don't own the product, right? You only have a license to the output. So many of these platforms have terms and conditions that might impact your overall business strategy. And more importantly, your ability to live up to your client on that business strategy. So yeah, definitely want to go more in depth about that when we hit that question in, in just a short time. But, but, sure, sure. Yeah. So, thank, thank you so much, Brian. A Andrew, I think you wanted to throw a, a yeah. word in there. Go ahead. In terms of creating that business case, and you got to get buy-in from somebody to hire your gig workers. Mm -hmm. So if you're creating that business case and you don't even know what skill set you're looking for, you're going to have to push it in the terms of what problem are we solving or what solution are we looking for? And if you put out there that you have a problem and you have, I mean, if you're going to use a, I mean, a job board or a gig, I mean, there's job boards out there dedicated to gig workers. And you say, here's a problem that I need help solving. You're going to get a slew of people that say, here's my solution. Here's how I want to do it. Yeah. And then you can identify your skill set that you need based on those responses. So if you don't have a business case because you don't know what skills you need, that's okay. Just identify your problem and identify the solution you're looking for. Right. And I think yeah. you're going to sell the solution instead of selling the skill. I, I, to add on this one, uh, Andrea, when, uh, when you go to a, uh, to, 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 to a consultant, one of the big four, for example, you, you tell them that you have a problem, they will sell you one of their own solutions. Whereas when you go to a freelancer or a gig worker and you tell them I have a problem and then you put it out there, that's exactly as you mentioned, then you will have them telling you, okay, I can help you out with my skills. And yeah, and then, and then it flows. And that might give you the opportunity to see solutions in Which ways you haven't thought have. about. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the intuitive nature of, of the gig economy allows that flexibility where I never knew I could do it this way, but thank you. And it turns out that it fits your culture better. It fits what you do better. You know, the opportunity yeah. there is just tremendous. Right. But it's, but it's making that small change first, like Paul mentioned and Brian spoke a little bit, um, you know, getting, you know, all, 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 all change is hard, right? But making a small change first, you know, proving, proving the ability and moving forward really seems to be key here. All right, let's move on to another um, question here. Uh, let's see, this one is from um, Sandy Brasillo and Sandy says, uh, ask, uh, and this is, this is going off in a different direction. Please provide some advice, maybe one or two key concepts for defining one's brand in the gig economy. And I'm going to come back, and if anybody feels slighted, you let me know. But I'm going to come back to Laurel, because I, Laurel, I think that uh, you, you're going to have something to say about this one. Go, go for it. 
You know, I do. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on personal brand. I assume that that's what's um, being referred to, but um, yeah, personal brand is, it's your gold. That's what, um, I mean, just as much as we market a product and a service and we are always trying to say, this is what makes us different. This is what makes us valuable. This is why we're worth your money, right? That's exactly what we have to do with our personal brand and really make it um, attractive and, and credible and, um, and easy to find all of the same concepts of business marketing need to apply to our personal marketing as well. Um, so absolutely the best thing that I ever did when back in the day when I was freelancing was uh, really flesh out my personal website, build a really strong portfolio, and then templatize my processes for um, my sales funnel, just as if I was templatizing them and optimizing a sales funnel for an, a full scale operation. I was doing the same thing for me and building my processes to be smooth and fast and so that I was um, increasing my profit margins as much as possible in maybe maybe, maybe from the position of um, you know and as we open it up to the rest of the group from your comments Laura, may, maybe more from the position of you know um, we have a lot of people out there right now because of current th you know things going on in the world current affairs um, who find themselves in a space and they're like you know maybe I'm you know whether whether by choice or otherwise maybe they're breaking into the gig economy right now. Mm -hmm. so you know what are some you know, um, some quick wins, some pro tips for people just coming in, you know, to, to get, you know, to get on top of their brand, you know, there's like plat, you know, what I do on LinkedIn, get myself out there on LinkedIn, other platforms, you know, but like maybe what are one, two or three, you know, what, what's the, what's the best approach from the panel's uh, position on, on how to get yourself out there as a new gig worker? I, I want to say, I want to say, I want to say something why I believe Laurel Farr is amazing. <laughs> this is going to be about oh, Laurel. This is the okay. new topic. Everybody gets to answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but Laurel, Laurel does some amazing things. And I think you, you really could like look at her profile and look at her journey to, to get this. Number one, I know exactly what to contact Laurel for. If I need to know if I'm a company that needs to go remote or I need remote consulting, like she has a very uh, niche. Well, before the pandemic, like she was like, Hey, I'm a remote consultant. Now she's like, Hey, I'm a remote. But like, you know exactly how to engage Laurel and what her value proposition is. And I think the number one place where people struggle is they tell you all the things that they've done in their career, but they haven't done the, the work to say, this is why I want to uh, tie. And so Laurel is, is a, a poster child for this is who I am. And this is do I can provide value. And oh, the, by the way, I've been doing remote consulting before it was even cool. So check me out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the second thing is that when you see Laurel, she shows up consistently. You know, when you see Laurel on screen or, or something, or when you talk to her, you know, there's this consistency about her narrative and how she talks and the advice she gives, uh, which I think is very important from a brand perspective. So whether mm -hmm. you work at Microsoft or any company, they protect the brand and that's how it shows up, what colors you use, what words you use. And so understanding, I think, what a brand means. And then the last thing on LinkedIn, look, you give what you get, you know, on LinkedIn, it's a community. And I started five years ago, really just responding to people, reaching out, asking questions. Yeah, I, I think I've met most of the people on this panel, you know, from LinkedIn. And so it's not one of those things where you update your profile and you sit there and you wait for people to come to you. You need to go and engage and have conversations. And I, and I guarantee if you spend 15, 20 minutes a day engaging with people and, and doing those things, uh, like I get excited if I do a post and Laurel Farr comments on it or even likes it, man, I like I run out of here, tell my kids that I've made it. And so that's amazing. So, yeah. So so I'm just saying like that, that type of, you know, an Emma too. So so you know that those types of things where you're engaging with people, you're saying, hey, that's a great idea. What about this? Like remember, whatever you put into LinkedIn is what you get out. And I for many years, not till five years ago, thought it was just like I'd stress and post my stuff and then leave it alone. I was afraid to comment. I was afraid to engage. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I, so I, can, I, Neil, I have, I have two, two things real quick. I want to expand on that real quick. One, I think Paul's also oh, selling, oh. Him short, selling himself short because I think Paul has done an amazing job at building up his personal brand. I've, I personally learned a lot from him. So if he means that he's learned from Laurel, then I've learned from Laurel as well, um, uh, which is great. So two things. One is, uh, actually three. One is to invest in like a calendaring app a calendaring link, Calendly, anything like that. Uh, and then be religious about incorporating that into every single communication with every single stranger. 
Um, I, I have been maniacal about sending my calendar out, and especially now, it's now more important than ever to the network. So make ne networking a, a A1 sport of yours and, and really get interested and fascinated in connecting with as many people as possible on the phone, using Zoom, whatever. Um, number two uh, is to, to make sure that you develop a point of view that you can then market. Try and find a domain that you can be represented as an expert in. And all it takes to be an expert is to have one other person say, this is an expert. So put yourself out there, let somebody let, you become known for something in the marketplace, put consistent pieces out on LinkedIn that people can like and read. And then finally, and this is the most important thing, is know your value. And I, I wanna say that one more time, know your value. So often I work with uh, uh, people who are trying to be new consultants and overwhelmingly they undercharge for their time. No question, full stop, they undercharge for their time by an order of magnitude. Especially so understand, women. Especially, especially women, women exactly. And yeah. that's a great point. So, so understand your value and stand by it. And you might just find that you're, you know, uh, you know I, I can think of three people off the top of my head who said, I'm going to charge $100 an hour. And I said, no, charge 500 And they got 500 right, right, right. And that's because we're limited to an employee mindset. But it's also and, for, for perceived value, right? Perceived exactly. Value. Exactly. You, you have this mindset of an employee and you're after a salary. And, you know, no, you are, you are a highly valued expert. And your experts and the value you bring is significant. So know your value and don't be afraid to charge, charge more than you think, more than you can imagine, because you just might get it. Yeah, I love that, Brian. And uh, one, one of the best compliments I hear from people um, often, people I don't see often, and I see them for lunch, and they'll say, I see you everywhere. And I was like, what, what do you mean? They, they see me engaging on, as Paul said, on LinkedIn. They see me engaging on other people's posts. They see me posting valuable, sharing valuable information. So they say, I see you everywhere. I feel like I know everything about yeah. you and I've never met you. I don't know anything about, but I know everything about you. I went, okay, that's a good thing I get. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. and you want it to be a positive thing, right? You want it obviously to, to, to put up positive information. You know, why do so many people whether you love or hate him, follow Gary Vaynerchuk because yeah. he puts out so much. He engages and he, he puts out so much content. And I know and he's people, consistent. He's consistent. Yeah. And I, I've, exactly. met, I've met individuals here in, in Little Burlington. They've gotten on text and video chats with him on Facebook Live, on LinkedIn. And they're going, I had no idea I'd be able to ever access somebody like him. And they yeah. get five, 10, 20 minutes to them, it's, it makes the world for them. Right? right. And it's very valuable to them. So be accessible. Maybe that's yeah. enough. Yeah. Be accessible, be accessible. And as Brian said, in make the network, you know, one of the things I do is on my way home from everyone leaves their office right now, we're all working from home, but you can even make this a practice. You're about to end your day at four fifty-five, five five o'clock, send a text, send a LinkedIn message, send, uh, make a quick call to somebody in your network. You just, and just, and, and the whole point of it is not, Hey, I'm, I'm here to sell something, whatever it's, it's all, Hey, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. That's it. That's the end of it. Just to see how you're doing. I'm not even calling to share anything. I'm just going to, and that lights people up because no one does that. And no I, one I, just I, calls to check in. Yeah. You know? I think that's a great point, yeah. Michael. And one other thing I want to add on to that, because that's such a great point. I wanted to, um, you know, and LinkedIn also allows you to provide, um, I think it's called endorsements of people, right? And validation. Yeah. Do unsolicited endorsements. Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, those are. You know, and th that just blows people's minds when all of a sudden somebody comes out from two years ago and says, I loved working with such and such and so and so. And at a minimum, it starts a conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to add one more thing and to build up on what Michael said is that just be genuine and uh, with, you know, when, when, when we meet people in person and we chat and we discuss before, a, before an event or a meeting, it just flows naturally. But whenever you are on a platform like LinkedIn, don't go and just approach people and ask for things. Just think about it like a normal, natural life <laughs> where you want to build a relationship. You want to talk about stuff that are interesting. When you see somebody posting something that is exciting to you, you know, just participate and, and, and build a relationship with that person. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, 
that's for me is um, it's 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 putting yourself out there, your brand, uh, being genuine. Uh, but this doesn't stop you from having a a, a USB. Uh, as 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 per, for the example of remote work, I can only think of Laurel. That's honestly how it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. These are great thoughts, all. And this is, I mean, honestly, like this is just good general advice: how to be a good person out there in the world. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just it, you yeah, know, it's being genuine. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on because we're we're already getting on almost an hour. I can't believe it. So let's move on. And Brian, this is back to. Uh, the, the, what you were trying to expound upon earlier, and I'm sorry I cut you off, but I saw this one coming, so I wanted to um, wait till we got there so we could do a more in-depth dive on it. So um, this question is from um, Susan Cook again, and she says, um, what are considerations and requirements before joining an online freelance community like Brain Trust or Fiverr? What are the upsides and the drawbacks? Well, from, from the buy side, I think from buying enterprise, if you're buying it, that's a very different perspective than if you're joining it. One right. of the key things you want to really understand is if you're joining the community, really understand the type of roles that you want to respond to and, and the, the alignment of those opportunities to your time specifically. Because what you might not realize, this, the take rate, which is the amount of money that they take from you personally, is pretty significant for some of these platforms. It's north of 20 something percent not to mention what they charge the client on the other end. Um, so if you're gonna engage with an application or some of the platforms, understand the take rate, understand the type of opportunities that you're gonna feel like you're gonna win. Because remember, on these applications, you're competing against a truly global marketplace. So to Paul's example, somebody, uh, a copywriter in Nigeria, uh, if you're gonna be doing similar services to that copywriter in Nigeria, you're competing in a global marketplace. So if you're gonna join it, really understand what value you bring, what type of opportunities are in there, and is this really a type of uh, a place you wanna spend your valuable time on? Now, engaging with those platforms as a user, no question, I think that everybody should be using these applications. Everyone should be leveraging Fiverr for their own businesses because it's a force multiplier. It allows you as a person to compete with larger firms. No question, no end, full stop. Just be aware of, of some of those other intangibles like I referenced in terms of that. But if you're gonna reference, if you're gonna re leverage platforms, make sure that that platform aligns with your delivery mode and the business model that you have. Like for us, we specialize in uh, high-end professional services. So, um, you know, none of the people who are on our network would ever consider being on a Fiverr because they bill, well, you know, $3 that. an hour, stuff like that. I mean, sorry. Yeah, they wouldn't be on up, Upwork either. I think no, they wouldn't be on Upwork. Upwork. They wouldn't be on Upwork. They wouldn't be on Fiverr. They wouldn't be on Insert Item Here. They wouldn't be on Mechanical Turk. They wouldn't be on any crowdsourcing applications. Um, you know, th those sorts of things are for highly transactional, uh, highly scalable, uh, highly distributable things. Now, there are applications like TopCoder that do that, that allow you to participate in other forms for other types of work. But for these, some of, most of those platforms, it, it, it's not necessarily I would necessarily recommend for people to run a business on. Yeah, and there, there's also vertical ones. There's business talent group. Yep. Uh, there's Emma's uh, One Circle. There's uh, Ask Rosie if you wanted uh, marketing. There's Second Shift, uh, who's uh, for women on their, on their second. Like, there are professional networks. I think people, because Upwork and Fiverr and some of these are public, and they get a lot of buzz in, in the B2B world, people sort of say, oh, well, which one of these should I choose? You know, you do a little bit of research, even in Brain Trust and others, in uh, Ryan's Kimono in um, in Canada. Like there are many of them that do professional grade work and work with enterprises. You know, at consulting based salaries. And so, you know, do your homework and, and see what's out there besides uh, the fibers and Upworks of, of the world. Because Upwork will go tell you they have you know 12 million freelancers on their platform, and one of the main challenges they have is is demand and utilization of that pool. So I've known people that have gotten on those platforms and say, hey, I hung my shingle, where's the work? Uh, and so I think if that's what you're expecting, you might be disappointed. And then one other thing, register, register with as many uh, platforms as you can. The cost to register is next to nothing. Uh, as someone who owns a platform, it's, I would kill myself for that, but multi-homing is a real challenge. We call it multi-homing. Um, if you wanna offer services on them, offer them on multiple. And I mean, there's some out there where you can get you know, a few hundred dollars an hour off of these services. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And I know like Toptal is supposed to be a good one. And then Graphite, I mean, that's one where you're getting three to six month gigs at $150, $220 an hour. 
and you're not hitting, you're not competing with the $3 an hour Upwork. Yeah. The average, the average opportunity in our platform is, is a hundred thousand bucks. Average. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Let's, let's move on to another one here. Um, I can't believe we've only got about another half an hour left. Uh, let's see. So the question, this one comes from Aaron Todd. Aaron asks, how does the gig economy affect the company's ability to develop high level teams? While gig workers can be exceptionally good, team dynamics can take time to develop and not everyone is always a good team fit. We, 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 we spoke this one um, yeah. uh, a little bit before, but, but Molly, you wanna you want talk about this one a little bit? Absolutely. So I think that um, for companies that have their culture and their values already established, right, and that's something that they can um, onboard on and their passion, I think that they have an easier time, right, finding people that align with that. I think that it's harder when you don't have that concept of culture internally, actually, um, for people to really be able to step into it. I think that as you're evaluating people to join your team, understanding kind of how they, how they have experienced teams in the past, sometimes they bring additional things to the table for that. So understanding your onboarding process, how long that takes to kind of ramp up, that is important. Um, and then so high level ability to develop high level teams, gig workers is definitely good. Um, so I think gig workers have experience with more different types of communication and different types of people that that kind of is their wheelhouse and some of their expertise. So I, I think that in, in general, bringing in a gig worker versus an employee, the gig worker is able to uh, to add value faster um, and uh, establish that team ethic. Okay, so what about what about the integration with the team though? I mean, that seems to be um, yeah, so as a project manager, I come in oftentimes, right, and I'm actually, you know, coming into a completely internal team, and I'm managing as an external vendor. So I think understanding who those key stakeholders are and decision makers is something that anytime you're starting as a project manager is really important. Um, but in terms of understanding the communication mechanisms between individuals, I mean, that's something that you already bring to the table, um, whether you're a gig worker or not. Um, but especially as a gig worker, you are used to having those sales conversations, those business development development conversations, those personal branding conversations. Um, so you come to the table with that expertise already. Right, right. Yeah, and I'm gonna follow on like the team dynamic piece. And it really just integrating yourself in there, into their team quickly, and maybe even doing some one-on-ones with all the different team members to understand who they are, who, besides their, just their role in that project. And then that helps you understand your interaction with them, their interactions with each other. And you can play off of that to increase how quickly that dynamic is going to build. And also maybe identify some risks in that dynamic early on. Yeah, I want to push on something. Like the idea that teams are static these days is, is something that I, I don't believe is, is true. And so when I started bringing in freelancers to do all sorts of things. I put pressure on, on the known model of a static team that was hired. And it was this agile team of people jumping in and out. And we had to adapt our processes in many ways, you know, years ago to work what Laurel will say is called remote working. Remember that? That was like this crazy word, like you can't work remote. Nobody can get. And so when you do that, though, when you figure out how to work remotely, when you figure out how to work across time zones, when you take projects and, and break them into tasks, you now become more resilient. And so I think one of the things that, that I learned early on was that breaking the mold of this thing that we sit in a meeting room and then like this like archaic 1950s feeling sort of way of working when you kind of bust that up and make these agile dynamic teams and bring people in and, and you learn skills that make you more resilient, make the projects more resilient and make the companies more resilient. And if we've learned anything in the past six months, it's say the way that things were working weren't necessarily designed to be resilient. And I think we've, we've all gone and got a master class uh, in some of these things. And so I, you know, I recommend questioning, you know, all, all of the assumptions on, hey, this is what a team looks like. And how do I, you know, mold this world into what I know instead of saying, hey, what, like, how do I kind of change the rules? understanding what your tribal knowledge is too. So when you're bringing someone else in and you're explaining, oh, we have to do this because of this, because of this, 
when you actually have to explain to someone, right, that's not in there and that it might be having multiple different teams or different processes being like, what? You do what? So really, when you bring someone in with that fresh face that is only going to be there for a temporary time, how much effort it takes to onboard that person really is a reflection of your process and your ability to onboard and your culture and the ability of your entire team to make autonomous decisions, right? If your whole mm. team knows this is our goal, this is our priority, this is what we're re working towards, it's super easy to bring someone else in because everyone else is going to go that way. I, I view it the same way as my toddler, right? Everyone else naps, so therefore he naps, right? But if everyone else is not doing it, then it's a lot harder to try to get someone to do something. So sorry to bring it back to kids, but seriously, if you have that culture, you have that vision, you have those um, already built in, it's very easy to bring someone else on. And if it's not, then even without the gig worker, there's other things you wanna be working on and probably having an extra team member is gonna help you. Mm -hmm. I was I distracted by the napping, personally. <laughs> that sounds really good to me. Yeah, no, I was I think, like, napping sounds great. <laughs> I think on the other side, if I was uh, in the position of the freelancer, especially getting started, I would prioritize two skills. Um, the first would be uh, learning how to establish trust in a virtual environment. And the second would be how to facilitate a meeting and take control of a room in a virtual environment. So we're going to um, have a meeting on just that. Okay. <laughs> just that stuff right there. That's a good, that's a good topic. I know a consulting agency that can help you with that, actually. Wait <laughs> <laughs> for it. Um, well represented here even. So, okay. Um, I'm going to move on to another question now and everybody just kind of, you know, maybe sit back in your chair, take a sip of your beverage and get ready for this singer from Dan Wetzel. All right. So Dan says, and this is more of a statement than a question, but here we go. The gig economy sounds great, but isn't it just another way to adapt to our capitalistic overlords agreement that we are resources that they can demand what they want of us and return us back to the surplus population when they want. Oh, Dan, oh my gosh. My father was forced into retirement in his early 60s and then did the consultant thing. I fear that employees have decided that 40 is the new 55 and the gig economy is just our way of telling the world we don't come to terms with an, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not coming to terms with it. We don't, <laughs> we don't come with an expiry date. Well, so I, I, I had actually, I would read this question. I, I thought about this question. Um, and so there's two, two things. I don't know if it fully answers this question, but there's two things I thought about. One is the gig economy and technology has flattened the world in many ways, right? We're, we're globally competing now. So a talented consultant independent freelancer in China can compete with somebody in Burlington, Vermont, can compete with somebody in New York, can compete with somebody in India, South Africa, you name it. And then secondly, the gig economy has created more, has created more opportunities for uh, the creation of solo, solo entrepreneurs and businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, it, okay. the, the position I take is that more people can now create and be their own business owner, be their own, so create their own structure, provide their own value, as opposed to the alternative, which, which I would say is you meet the average employee. They are miserable at their job. They are absolutely miserable because they know the value they're providing at work is not their highest value as a human being. Yep. They know that in, inside, yep. but, they, but the, the world of the past required them to stay there to put food on the table. Right. Now with mobility, with technology, with our ability to move, with the pandemic that has forced everybody to work from home and excel, it's accelerated, everyone gets the opportunity to provide the highest value to the world. Mm -hmm. That's why I think about the gig economy. I think about it in the positive light. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so and it's, it's never been like this in history. Yeah. No, no position in history where has a single human being, more human beings in the world been able to offer to other human beings in the world um, uh, in an indefinite, infinite, infinite audience, their highest value. And you name the trade, you name the service. It doesn't yep. have to be in project management. It could be in entertainment. It could be anything. You name it. It's a unique time in history. That, that's that's what yeah. I, I, I would say it's a it's a shrunken uh, uh, global pool of talent actually. So you have access to all of this talent that is everywhere. I would like to reverse this uh, question, if I may. I don't know if it's dangerous to do it, but in in South Africa, there's the biggest uh, um, or the, the 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 what do you say? The biggest population of young people. 
Okay, so there's more than 50% of the people are under the age of 27, 28. Mm -hmm. Unemployment is extremely high, so mm -hmm. you can imagine. So what businesses are doing is that they're actually forcing people into early retirement in order to open up opportunities for the young generation that is there. Because people graduate from universities, they go into internships, there is no jobs, even after two to three years of internship. Mm -hmm. So, so forced into early retirement, and I remember Paul and I had this discussion before, is that at that age group, 40 to 50 to 55, or more 50, so they're more of a well, sandwiched uh, generation. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is they are taking care of their own kids, but they are also taking care of their own parents. So, and, and, and a lot of times it's, it's when it reverses, then their, their kids need to take care of them and there's nobody to take care of their own parents. So when, when it comes to the gig economy, it creates opportunities for them because suddenly it's, it's that dream of being able to do, to work on stuff that actually excite you while you are being, while you are at home mm -hmm. and, and home could be anywhere. So, and you've, you're independent, you've got income that is coming and you can take care of your kids, you can take care of your parents without feeling that pressure. So uh, this is where I think of opportunities where, where and, 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 and this is why most of our talent as well come from uh, uh, countries like South Africa where you, other countries around the world and the developed economies, they can actually afford this talent. So you can get highly skilled professional people with 20, 30 years of experience who got forced into retirement. But, but because of the difference in the exchange rate, et cetera, you can actually afford them. Mm -hmm. So you are paying a, a, a senior partner level, a junior rate. And, and there's, there's a beauty in that because you are getting excellent work. So, uh, so, so yeah, I, 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 I agree with Michael. I think about this as, as, as the opportunity that is coming along with it, that is relieving a lot of pressure. However, uh, there's a lot of organizations that are out there that are starting to help those people in this particular age group to not to wait until they are forced into retirement or they retire. Mm -hmm. They need to start yeah. embra embracing this. They need to start embracing uh, the gig economy. They need to start having side gigs so they can build their reputation, so they can uh, build their portfolio, so they can experience it because it's not that scary. I think the, the interesting thing about the, the question, because I love talking about my, my year for overlords, the social contract with workers has changed, full stop. You know, in the, my book, I start like, my dad had a pension, my grandfather had a pension, and there's like, I, I don't know of a company, I'm not saying there aren't any, that still offer pensions. And so the first thing is, you know, the, corp, the, the relationship that people have with organizations to year 60, you know, right out the last five, like that has changed. To Michael's point, Technology flattened everything. I remember reading Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and it was talking about manufacturing that would be given to knowledge work. And it's just taken 15 years for, for that, those ideas to become true. So now knowledge work is being globally processed and you're competing. And so those are just realities. And, and I think that, you know, just like poker or anything, you have to play the hand that you're, you're dealt. And so when I looked at my journey, I had two choices. I could sit in technology and I could you know, be fairly well paid and I'd be 55 years old and I'd be out. And mine wasn't, will I have money? It's like, I'm 55 years old. How do I stay relevant? Like, how do I stay engaged? What do I do? Like, what is my life? Like I've been in corporate America for 30 years and now I'm going to go do what? Mm -hmm. And I've seen everywhere from corporate vice presidents struggle with this question where it's not about the money. It's, hey, I'm 50 years old and I've got these skills and they don't transfer to anything. They don't, they don't provide me to be relevant beyond that. And so I think it's less about the corporate overlords, just that business is changing. Technology is, is of course changing everything. And I think sometimes people get lost in the buzzwords. They're like, oh yeah, I get it, AI and automation and everyone's a technology company, software is eating the world. And, and they don't realize what that's doing to our careers and, and how we respond. And so my, answer to that was I disrupted myself. 
you know, I, I worked at a very good company at a very good salary and I disrupted myself because I believe that disruption will allow me to stay relevant and kind of own my own destiny. And I know many other people who are starting to do that, not waiting for the day that, you know, the company kind of kicks them to the curb and saying, thank you so much for your 15 years of service, but sort of doing that training while they're in place at the corporation and saying, hey, thank you so much for, for taking me here, uh, corporation. I'm going to go, I'm going to create my own path now. Yeah. And I think that's what you see with a lot of, you know, high dollar consultants and stuff, sort of taking ownership of the fact that that is the way the world operates now. This, this is a really great question and, and, and a couple of real elements about it. We talked a little bit about in the beginning about the mind shift of an employee versus a business owner. And in, in the United States, a lot, of, a lot of this, the question, a lot of questions, and I, I personally include myself in this, it's a, it's a challenging transition to think about being an employee to being a business owner. And, and if you own your own, and, and there's nothing wrong with being an either one. But statistically speaking, people who are uh, independent contractors are overwhelmingly more satisfied with their jobs on every measure of life happiness. They're happier than what they have. They have better control of their freedom. They have, they have the ability to make more money than they do as an employee. And it's also generational. Statistically speaking, more Gen Zers are taking on a career as, as gig workers voluntarily over an employee's overall. Um, so, so, so by every dimension, it, it's an improvement. Um, the way you, you need to, to think about the, the gig economy and, and that like is, it's a, it's, a democratiza it's a democratization of opportunity. It allows everyone to compete in the same way. And if you use the tools, like for example, like Paul does, um, you wouldn't know that he's Paul Este as a one man show. You would think he has a whole staff of hundreds of people working behind him. And, and that comes from leveraging the gig economy. So it's a, it's a, I use the phrase force multiplier, but that's exactly what it is. It allows you to, to punch above your weight um, and the like. Another thing to think about is specifically in the States, no one celebrates a W2 employee, right? No one is a kid and they grow up dreaming about what they want to do when they grow up. And they say, I want to be a W2 employee in middle management. And that's the way I want to spend my life you know, pursuing opportunity, controlling your destiny, that is a, a distinctly uh, a unique perspective. And it's certainly something to aspire to. Where the dissonance occurs is in, in, uh, uh, in the exact inverse, and Paul referenced it and, and Michael referenced it as well, which is the, you're not realizing the true value of your output when you're an employee. You're just not, right? You're, you're generating orders of magnitude over employment, and sometimes you can even look up if you're working for an organization, the revenue per employee, right? So you might be paid $60,000, but XYZ company has $500,000 of revenue per employee. So if you look at the gig economy as a, a net less as a disruptive to the existing paradigm and disrupting employment, it allows you to capture the true value of what makes you unique in the marketplace. So I want to add two different things to this and specifically as a project manager that literally just went out on my own a year ago in my experience. Okay. So the first thing is as a gig worker versus a W2, because I worked in consulting project management consulting for eight years before I went out on my own. When you're going out in the gig, right? It's that you're going closer to the wind, right? The extremes are higher in terms of joy and excitement and passion and what you're getting to work on. And guess what? Those lows are a lot lower. And the risk associated with that and, and the stress associated with that is much more personal, right? And so what I would say is when they're talking about this, um, I would say that uh, at going out on my own, I would say that for some people, this is fantastic. This is what you need to get your passion back and your excitement back. And for some other people, I would say this might not be the path for you, not because you wouldn't be good at it, but because those highs and lows are not what you're looking for in your life right now. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece in terms of that they're talking about is that ability to specialize. So as project managers, you could be a project manager at 33, like I am, and you could literally be looking at a project manager for the being a project manager for the rest of your life. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of project managers take on bigger, more complex projects, right? That's how they grow in their career and that's how they kind of stay invigorated. Well, what if you want to take a different path? What if you want to work with smaller clients? What if you want to work on, you know what I mean? When you are working as an employer, your percentage of time is spent on things that you are passionate about and exciting and learning about versus the amount of time you're spending on bureaucracy is different than when you're going out on your own as a gig worker and you're being able
able to be closer to the work. Um, and so I would say that some of that draining pieces are, are, are not there. Um, in terms of like the overall economy, I think that that ability to specialize and really understand your value and where you fit into the equation and being able to start articulating that versus just I'm a project manager for this company and the company provides something, you really understand your piece of the puzzle in a lot different way. Um, and again, I think that that invigorates and adds to our productivity as gig workers. And I think as gig workers, we have, you know, like we said, we're looking for our reputation, what we do, we have to stay afloat. That helps us provide even more, even better services than your typical employee. Mm -hmm. uh, your employee sits there with benefits and they know, you know, they have to do something significantly wrong to be shown the door. And I mean, how many employees do you see or have you seen over your time that have, you know, done the bare minimum to stay employed, you know, have a piss poor attitude about everything, you know, blame other employees, you know, never take anything for what it's worth. And they're the ones that get to sit there and keep collecting their salary and their 401k and, you know, paid health insurance. And we're the ones that are providing that ad added value. So I, we have to maybe fight to get to get a little more, but I don't think we're going to see the same thing where we're not going to be thrrown to the surplus population because people are going to start seeing that value. Neil, I, I want to jump. Jess, oh. no, I'm <laughs> sorry. Ahead. I'm sorry, Laura. Go ahead. <laughs> You're so funny. Uh, no, I was just going to build on the word fight that you said, Andrea, that I think that that's really important because there is very, 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 very few regulations or legislation that surrounds all of what we're talking about, right? There is very few protection, uh, or very little protection for people that are freelancing. There are no laws about remote working in general. So what's happened with this hyper growth of the conversation about remote work and the gig economy um, in the year 2020 is these conversations have developed by 10 years in the span of two weeks. And so what's happened is all of these laws that traditionally would protect us and say, hey, guess what? You, I need the same rights to get a mortgage as somebody who is an employee, or I need to be able to get health insurance as easily as somebody who is an employee. All of those protections don't exist yet. So we all have to be part of, like Andrea was saying, we have to be willing to fight and say, this is something that is good and it's worth it. Um, yes, I mean, to validate your concerns, Stan, there are going to be companies that are going to abuse this period. Like, yes, this is a sunshine and rainbows conversation, but there is a dark side to it. There's a dark side to everything. So yes, there are going to be companies that abuse it, but the more that we fight and we fight for the good side, the more that we will be able to promote and, and protect that good side. I want to talk, I, I want to answer Jessica's question on a very tactical level. Look, in the United States, benefits are tied to your job. It's the way it is. It's absolutely crazy. And it's not that way in almost every other industrialized place on the planet Earth. And so you're competing against people that have a different model um, than we have in the United States. There, there's a couple of ways to think about it. Number one, sometimes, you know, you have a spouse, right, and, and a, a partner and you're able to choose on when somebody might be able to freelance and cover for the insurance and switch and stuff like that. I've seen that. The other thing I wanna go back to Brian's point and the one that Laurel said, sometimes people go, when you know your worth and they don't price in health insurance and other things. You know, when, when you look at sort of your hourly rate and you wanna go independent, um, you need to price in all of the things that you need as if you were going to be working for something. You can't just like price in your time and forget about health insurance or, or savings or whatever those, whatever your um, budget requires. And, and the third thing, look, there are, there are firms, staffing firms that do provide, you know, allow you to be independent and do provide some benefits. And, and that's a path where you're, you're not as tied to a corporation. You do have different engagements and are able to switch around and you're able to get some benefits. And so, look, health insurance is a real issue, um, you know, but I think there are ways to, to think about it. And those are just a couple. So, so we, we uh, a couple of things real quickly, because this is a huge issue for a lot of folks. Statistically speaking, um, most people who are working in the independent economy, open to talent economy, gig workers, the uptake of the insurance is historically relatively low. So, so on average, statistically, it's about 20, 25% of people who are independent look to, you know, get 
their health insurance through their staffing provider or through a consulting firm, things like that. They usually get it through a spouse. The overwhelming prevalence of it is through a spouse. That being said, there are dozens of resources available specifically geared towards providing financial services, insurance services, all those sorts of things to gig workers. Lily, I mean, they're, they're literally, uh, the, the name goes on on and.co, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, there are options out there. It's not free and it's a, certainly something you need to consider. Another thing to think about is Paul uh, referenced a staffing firm. You know, look at, at what we do, you know, at MBO and I'm not, we offer health insurance to uh, people who we contract with through our network. Sometimes it's available through, the, through a Catlet, through a BTG. There are different sort of engagement modes that allow you to take advantage of, of uh, employee-like benefits while not being an employee. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't want to do too much selling, but that's it. That's uh, that's an option. That's that's okay. Again, we'll do we'll do a follow up communication and writing everybody after this after these sessions to kind of you know get get everybody's information out there. So we really appreciate your time. So let's see. Let's at least get one more question here. We're five minutes or so before the hour. Um, so uh, Paul Gale says, uh, and sorry, Paul, I, I kind of truncated your question a little bit just to put a finer point on it, but. Um, he, he, he says, we've been talking about how it's a world of skills rather than certifications. Well, how do we find out what skills employers are looking for in a project manager in the gig economy? I don't think they're any different. I don't think there's like, hey, there's a bunch of skills people are looking for in the gig economy as compared to, you know, at, at companies. I think the, there's a guy uh, who I interviewed uh, named Tucker Max, and he said something to me that was really interesting. It was, you know, we're, we're going into a world where it's proof of work. And I want to go back to something somebody asked earlier about, you know, how do I, how do I hang my shingle? Tell me about personal brand. Mm -hmm. it, it's more important than ever that you put your work and your value out into the public conversation. I think a lot of people sit there and like, wait for their manager to, I did this, I'm guilty. So let me talk about me, not about anyone else. I'd sit there and be like, oh yes, Mr. Manager and I, or Mrs. Manager, and I put my information in the tool and I'd sit there and they rate me at the end of the year. And I tell you, when I published my first article, I was like scared. I, I went to hit send and I was like freaked out and I wouldn't do it. And then the next day I came back and I, and I did it. And it's funny to me now because I just say a bunch of crazy stuff, but like once I put myself out there, once I was vulnerable and started having a conversation, people started to understand the type of work that I did, the type of value I couldn't. So I no longer made the conversation only internally inside my company. I put my proof of work externally. I talked about the projects I did and why and what I learned. And, and so I think, you know, start putting yourself out there and people will reach out and you'll, you'll learn pretty quickly. Any, anyone else in these uh, closing minutes of our of our uh, session tonight? We touched on it with the onboarding piece, right? So when you're coming in as a gig worker and you're thinking about a PM, right? How, how, how do you onboard quickly, right? How do you bring your skill set forward and provide immediate value? How much investment? So um, uh, Tuck Consulting has a great one, which is um, expertise without overhead. How do you come into the how, you know what I mean? How do you come into the team and immediately start adding value? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, that you need to provide that to your potential employer, potential um, uh, future manager, right? Versus them having to look for it. They are gonna provide you a job description of a project manager and tell you how long that they want that. And you need to say, I'm the right project manager for you because I'm going to be handling, I'm going to be doing this. So flexibility, right? They're looking for flexibility. They don't want you to have to have everything fully, you know what I mean? They want you to be able to work in their framework. They want you to be able to work outside of their framework and bring something else to the table. So I think that flexibility is a big one, right? Especially when you talk about PMPs and some of our processes where we're very black and white. Um, flexibility, I think, as a PM is definitely something you want to bring forward as you're um, promoting gig work for project manager. The one question for this about the world of skills, uh, what skills employees are looking for. Uh, I referenced this before, but I can't impart this enough. Register with as many platforms as possible. The cost to sign up is 15 minutes of your time, and you see all these opportunities, you get some idea of what people are looking for, how they're looking for, what descriptions are in the job descriptions, how you can tailor your resume. Um, that's the best way to be on top of what skills are out there. And by signing up with those platforms, they'll often, often tell you, hey, we're really looking for these type of skills. Uh, that's, the most e that's the easiest tactical thing to do. And, and it seems to be job. specific. 
<laughs> we right, overlapped specific, again. <laughs> speak truth to their speak truth to their pain points, right? You're proving your experience by being able to clearly articulate the pain point that they are trying to solve. So as a project manager, you have scars. You are not a project mm. manager if you do not have scars. So <laughs> being able to speak to those scars, right, in a proactive and in a positive way, mm -hmm. right? that is key so positivity and being able to speak truth to those difficulties if you're coming in and everything's rosy and perfect and all your projects have been perfectly on time and perfectly on budget you've never had any issues i don't know that's a red flag for me <laughs> so, project manager. Yeah. i think you know um earlier we talked about having you know a good bedside manner regardless of all your skills presenting yourself with the you know communication and you know being timely you know sometimes just because you're working on something else for a little bit, you can take five minutes to respond to somebody who you're trying to build that relationship with. And that, you know, I mean, I think Michael was saying it earlier too, like just reach out to people, talk to people, have that level of responsiveness where they're like, okay, you, you see value in this and it's not just a paycheck. Okay. Yeah. Right. I would say as well, maybe make things easier and not complicated. So you're there to provide a solution uh to address a pain point so just make things easier and provide the solutions uh, uh no complications and at the same time don't forget to sell at the same time as you are working on a project a lot of people just focus on their project and they don't build any pipeline as they are going uh so uh you need to manage to juggle both at the same time mm -hmm. okay go so I thought I'm the, the one word. who's sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the last thing I was going to say is like circle you stinker. Um, <laughs> circle back to your um, unique unique value proposition, right? Like this is truly full circle. This is exactly what we talked about at the beginning. But if you're saying I'm a project manager you are competing with millions of project managers. If mm -hmm. you say, I am a project manager that specializes in this size of company for this industry with this type of project, mm -hmm. then you're only competing with a small handful and you have a way, way higher success and conversion rate. Mm -hmm. hey, she's awesome, man. I learned from her. <laughs> yes. Big fan, big fan. <laughs> I'm literally <laughs> blushing. This is the it most embarrassing oh. <laughs> Napping, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're napping earlier. Yeah, napping. I, I like that. Go, I, want, I want to keep us going, but I, I think, I think I've, I've, I'm going to have to, I'm have to call it here. Um, so I do want to say um, a special thanks, and everybody can go catch a nap in just a moment. Um, a special thanks to all of our panelists and all the participants. It's really been great. Um, you know, uh, uh, I look forward to hopefully engaging with all of you at future events for PMICV or elsewhere. Please, everybody, keep in touch. Keep us aware. Um, connect with these folks on LinkedIn and follow them so you know what's going on. Follow the organization so that you can keep abreast of these. Go out there and network like everybody's saying. Make yourself known and, 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 and find success in the gig economy. So let's just go around real fast here and put you all on point. Just one word for our gig economy workers. Ready, set, go, Brian. Oh, geez. One Ooh. word? One word. Oh, um, possibility. How's that? Michael. Action. Emma. Motivation. Uh, Molly. Passion. Uh, Laurel. Mm. Authenticity. Uh, Andrea. Consistency. Paul. Start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. It's been great. Um, it, it's, as long as all the panelists agree right here, I'm going to post this to YouTube in short order. Are you good with that? That's fine. Let's share that link around. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thank you, guys. It's been a wonderful um, uh, session, and I really appreciate your time. Have a fantastic evening.